This is the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, episode number 99. Many professions, including content strategy, worry about not having a seat at the table when it comes to influencing business decisions. Beth Dunn's solution to this is simple. Build your own table. This stance exemplifies Beth's scrappy, pragmatic approach to content work. She invites her colleagues to the table, listens to them, and then co-creates with them tailor-made content programs that grow and scale with the organization. Welcome to the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, where accomplished content strategy experts share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. Our mission is to democratize content strategy, to make its principles and practices accessible to everyone. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 99 of the Content Strategy Insights Podcast. I'm really happy today to have with us Beth Dunn. Uh, Beth does content and communications at uh, HubSpot, but more importantly, to me anyway, for this podcast, she just wrote a book called Cultivating Content Design. Uh, So welcome, Beth. Tell the folks a little bit more about your work there at HubSpot and how you came to write your book. Absolutely. Well, thank you for having me on here. So it's uh, so thrilling. Um, and yeah, so uh, I'm a longtime HubSpotter. I was one of those people that started off when it was like a really like small band of weirdos. And now it's just a large band of weirdos, which is great. Um, so I started there in uh, January 2010 and uh, uh, kind of started off as the... Um, the person who would annoy the engineers and say, could you please make the the wording on the screen make more sense? You know, I was in like a customer service role, but in a room full of, I think there were 50 people at the time, I immediately sort of stood out as the one who was harassing people and saying, can we, can we make this more clear? It would be more clear to the customers. And that just sort of, sort of evolved over time into an official role as a UX writer. We actually ended up um, hiring a direct, our first director of design was Joshua Porter, who people might know as Bacardo um, on Twitter. And he was kind of one of the first popularizers of the idea of microcopy as a science and UX writing as a thing. And um, so he kind of sat me down on my first day and said, what is it that you do with your time? And I said, I told him and he was like, oh, you're my UX writer. I had never heard this, the term before. Um, so it kind of grew from there. And then I ended up um, uh, growing the team and we switched it to content design. We can talk about that. Um, and, and from there, I sort of started having this idea for this book. I started talking about it at conferences and things, and it just sort of evolved from there. There seemed to be a need for it. So I put it out there. Well, so you're you're like the perfect microcosm of this whole phenomenon because like the like being told, oh, great, you're my UX writer. You know, that's like that's kind of a, a common ritual in this whole thing that like you, you we never figured out ourselves. Somebody always tells us, it seems like. Um, and then that the growth and then the evolution of that into a content design practice. But then the other thing that you really bring to this, I think, and that that is an ongoing concern to everybody in this is like we're all like, damn it, we can't get our seat at the table. And you have this great approach that's grown out of this long experience in this where you're like, that's the wrong way to look at it. You got to build your own table. Tell, tell us more about that. Yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, it's, it's gratifying that you see it as uh, kind of a, a new and remarkable thing. It, it really just happened organically for me. I, like many, many people, started off with really just sort of being grateful that people were asking me to do that sort of final stage proofreading to begin with, like when UX writing wasn't even a thing, I was just glad that I got to be the final gatekeeper when I did to stop there from being something out there embarrassing or with a typo in it or something like that. Um, and then, you know, you started being aware of this deeper work that you could do. And and like many people, I started, you know, harassing people and saying, you know, you should invite me earlier. I didn't, you know, why wasn't I at the beginning and whatever. Um, and I, and I, the first thing I did was I developed this model, the layers model, um, based on the the layers model of UX. um, And I would show that to people and to give them an idea of the deeper work that content really should do. And they'd sort of get it intellectually, um, but they don't get it until you actually show them how it, you know, show it to them in action. And so, yeah, I I just started realizing I needed to turn it on its head. I needed to turn the the traditional way of trying to um, advocate for a seat at the strategic table, uh, an invitation to the earliest possible meeting. Um, I just needed to go about that in completely the opposite way. Yeah, no, and I love the way you do that because that's the the entry point into that is that like, and I'm assuming, I'm just gonna assume that those early conversations where you're annoying the engineers were probably about those top level things about like, 
wow, we said that one way here and now you're saying it that way there or that's grammatically incorrect or whatever the issue is. Um, and then, so you have that insight that like you're always starting at the top. That seems like where all of us start is that surface layer. And then tell me a little bit more about how you get people. Well, first of all, tell us about the layers and mm -hmm. how you articulate them and then how you get people to go deeper with you. Sure. Okay, so the layers model, and I, I took the, the seven layers of UX model that everybody's familiar with, right? Um, and I simplified that down. Like I started looking at that and saying, what role does content play in each one of these layers? And there's actually a really, for those of us in the field, there's a very clear role for a content person to play in each one of those layers. And I started by sort of just mapping each, you know, an activity, a content activity and artifacts and things like that to each one of the layers. And when I would show that to stakeholders, it was a lot, it was just like complicated. Um, they didn't really get it. And so I ended up streamlining and simplifying it into three different layers that surface at the top, um, uh, structure in the middle and scope, um, strategy and scope at the, at, the, at the bottom layer because everybody likes alliteration and consonants, right? So everything starts with an S, very simple, straightforward. Um, and what it does is it gives people, the people who don't get it yet, the clarity of like, oh, surface is just the surface. And they thought that was all I was there for. So when you're telling people, you know, why don't you invite me to kickoff meeting? Why don't you invite me to whatever to, why don't you let me help out with research, you know, discovery and, you know, articulating the problem. They literally don't know what you would have to offer at that stage because all they think is, well, there's nothing for you to proofread yet. There's no copy for you to wordsmith. So like, it's just like all these, these little confused question marks like in a cartoon over their heads. So, you know, so if you show them that graphic and kind of say, here are the ways in which I can engage with a project at each level, right? Then they, they sort of start to get it intellectually. Yeah, and that's the that's the thing I think the big contribution your book is going to make is that it stitches together like, oh, great. You know, you could sit down and have a 10 minute conversation with anybody about this and they would until like, oh, oh, well, that makes perfect sense. And then it never happens in the organization, you know. But right, and, you, then, and they once again forget to invite you and they want to because they don't qu they haven't quite gotten it into their bones yet. And so the process that I spell out in the book is a way of actually kind of getting it into their muscle memory about the role that content can play deeper and deeper and deeper. So yeah, when I talk about flipping it on its, on its head, I, what I'm doing is just taking what you said was a very pragmatic approach, which is people are already happy to work with you in the, in the surface layer, right? So start with those people who really like working with you on that surface layer. And the next time they ask you for help, just take, you know, give them what they want, but take them a little bit deeper. And I do this in the form of a workshop, right? A very structured workshop that kind of answers certain questions, helps them get better at some of their most common problems in the surface layer. Everybody has their little ticks, right? One team that you work with will love to put comma splices everywhere, but another team will just have too casual a tone or something, you know? And so if you just like get them better at one thing that will cut down your call rate, you know, like you're a support rep, right? It'll cut down your call rate from them from like 20%, right? And then you just like give them like, oh, and if you also did something a little bit deeper and you start to dip into the, the structure stuff, say so like expose them to some of the usability stuff you could help them with or expose them to some of the uh, learnability or accessibility stuff that you could help them with. You really start to see their eyes light up and they're there with you, you know, and if you tie it to the metrics that matter to them and you can show them that they're getting an improvement in a metric that they live and die by, like, like, um, like, like revenue, right? Like, you know, like something really business meaningful, then they see the impact that content can have on the work that they do. Right. And that's like the human centered user focused manifestation of enterprise work. It's like these people who you work with are your customers and exactly. yeah, that's, I yes. love that. <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. It's user centered organizational change, basically, you know, you're, you're designing it around what their needs are and what their view of the world is. Right. And you have a lot of, I love, and you're, you're like a, a hyper communicator. I think, mm -hmm. you know, that like the, one of the ways you do that, that you talk about in the book is like just a lot of communication. And, and I don't want to spoil the story, but a lot, a lot of the communication is really curating. It's like, you're just engaging people and then listening and then spitting back what they say 
as you correct me if I'm oversimplifying that, but tell us a little, tell me a little bit more about how that, that process of engagement and communication fits in all this. Yeah. I mean, I think that you really hit on something that perhaps I wouldn't have articulated exactly that way, but I think it's really true that, you know, I, I know that when I, when I talk to other content people who are trying to scale what they do and they kind of articulate this like, Oh, workshops and maybe a newsletter and, you know, uh, that sort of thing. It sounds like I'm really adding a lot of work to them, but actually in practice, the way that I do these things is exactly what you're saying. You just kind of let people tell you what they already do and what there's, what they're, problems are what their needs are and like what okay and what content are you using today to address those needs right and uh you you just sort of tweak it a little bit and say well what if you did this so you're not really creating something net new all of the time you're just taking something that exists and kind of giving it a quarter turn you know and then giving it back to them just to demonstrate it's the difference between doing work and sort of demoing work, if you will. Yep. And that's something that comes through throughout the book is that sort of pragmatic incremental approach. Is that, did, is that something you consciously cultivated or just kind of emerged as like, oh, this is the way to do this? Um, I'm a, I think I'm just a very pragmatic person at heart. I, it's, it's funny because that's a, that's a word that has sort of followed me throughout my my career, um, I just, um, I, I think that's just in my bones. I, I just, I, I, I was just actually talking to somebody the other day about where that might come from. And I think it's because I was raised, it was the phrase that I use resource constrained. Um, and so I, 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 we were, I was poor when I was a kid, right? And so it's just, a, it's just another version of thrift. You know, you just take what you have and see what you can build with that. And if what you have is a couple of people in your organization who get it, and sort of get how to work with you. And a lot of people who are resistant, well, work with your assets and try to make the most of those assets that you can. Let those other people just ignore them for now and just try to build the people that are your assets, that are your potential champions, start working, investing heavily in them. It's just thrift, really. Yeah, and that's such a great balance to like, because so many of us, I mean, I certainly have done this a lot, you know, you just get to like, God, if people could just see all the benefits, all the stuff that we offer, you know, and you come up with these grand plans or, you know, big things. And um, I guess, can you, because you seem, you just described your background and the the native uh, facility you have with that. Have you coached other people through that to become more pragmatic or can you help folks along with that? Yeah, I mean, one of the, one of the, um analogies that seems to resonate with people is I think that a lot, especially uh, people who work in content, you know, whether we consider ourselves writers at heart or editors at heart or whatever, a lot of us followed a similar journey where um, we, we, we didn't really invest in that. I know this is true for me. I didn't really invest fully in that um, strength of myself for a really long time. I kind of thought it was a tool in my tool belt, but not like central to who I was and what I could do in a role. Um, and I spent a lot of time instead working on kind of filling in my deficiencies, like, oh, I'm terrible at math, you know, I should get better at math. You know, it took me a really embarrassingly long period of time to realize that I was only ever gonna be like, like at best mediocre, at math, you know? Um, and that what I should do is play to my strengths. And like, if I'm pretty darn good with words, imagine if I invested in that, I could be really quite, quite something remarkable. And it's the same thing with organizational change. It's like if you invest in the things that are already kind of strong and that people seem to get that, you know, because we've all had that personal experience of something that is a strength of ours that we really probably should have started dropping a dime into that piggy bank a lot earlier. Yep. No, and I love that the way you just described that this because this really is organizational change yes. and it's um, and you do it. And also just back to your background, one thing that occurred to me and in, in, as I was reading the book and and then as you talk about like your background, because I, I kind of come from like scrappy lower middle class roots myself. And um, and I was thinking about Tom Sawyer, you know, the 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 Mark Twain story of Mark, of, of, you know, of, I, I assume everybody knows this, but Tom Sawyer just kind of recruiting all the kids to paint the fence with him. Is that uh, is is that the right metaphor for? There's a lot of Tom Sawyering in this book too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Because one of the first moves, of course, is that you run a, a content workshop that sort of, and specifically for these people who are already engaged, like working with you, see the value of that. You try and get them, a few of them, to do some of that surface work for you. You can train some sympathetic people 
to do a better job of checking the style guide or running it through something like Grammarly or Hemingway. And just like, you know, I think one of the major turning points for me was when I realized that I was spending 90% of my time fixing the same five mistakes. You know, it was either like exclamation marks or commas, or, you know, it was all like wicked surface stuff. Um, and it was, and it was literally the same five things. And so I put together a workshop that informed people about how to handle these five common things. And that one workshop, when I started getting like a critical mass of tea, I just do it on small teams, you know, maybe eight to 15 people at a time. Um, once I hit a critical mass of teams I'd run that with, I suddenly found like the weight on my shoulders was was really, really remarkably lifted. I was getting so many fewer requests for that kind of surface help. And that was when I was able to start digging deeper into deeper work. So that's why I focus on find your five. Everybody's, I think, I think most of us are spending like 80 to 90% of our time on five things that if we just saw Tom Sawyered it and asked, other, you know, taught it to other people and said, you know, if you just like move the paintbrush up and down like this, it actually, you know, goes really well. <laughs> yeah. um, and then we can do deeper work. We can do stuff that is a better use of our brain power and our time and our skills. Hey, why don't you talk a little bit about more that define your five? Because I've, I've had the benefit of reading the book, so I know what sure. you're talking about. But if you could just uh, talk a little bit about that, because I think that's a brilliant methodology to bring focus to this work. Sure. Yeah, the the and again, this this sort of evolved organically. You know, um, the way that I recommend people start these workshops is start off by people who raise their hand and send you something. Hey, could you just? It always starts with that, right? Hey, could you just take a look at this and just kind of, you know, do your thing, wave your magic wand at it, and and it's 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 really common that it's some other team that we don't technically work for right inside of our organizations like a sales team wants us to take a look at their email or you know that they send out to leads or marketing team want, you know could you just take a look at our landing page it's not quite converting the way we want it to so the next time somebody asks you for that you can say i would love to help you with that but why don't i do it for your whole team and you offer them a workshop right and so the way that I start, the way that I develop this workshop for teams that say yes to that offer is I say, all right, you wanted me to look at your landing page. Send me like five versions of that landing page that you're having trouble with. Five's a good number, I like five. So they send me five, right? And it, that can be loose. Sometimes people have sent me 20 and that's fine, you know? Um, and you just kind of go through those and you look for the patterns. You, you look for those five things that, and every team has these things that like, if they just did these five things better, differently, more according to your voice, tone, style guide, whatever. And that's for a surface workshop. There are other workshops for structure and for scope. Um, they just did these five things differently. They would be 80% better. They would see a mark, they would see a market change. And so you just look for those patterns. Every, you know, if anybody sends you like five types of the same piece of content, you're gonna be able to find five things right away that go, okay, do this differently. Um, instead of, you know, instead of approaching tone in that way, do it this way. Don't use commas like that. You know, trim down your exclamation mark usage. Like we all know these things, right? And you don't have to, you don't have to be shy about repeating your information for different teams too. It's going to be the same across some teams. But um, so that's it. It's find your five. And then what's amazing is that when you deliver those workshops to people and kind of teach them those five things, they're thrilled. Like a lot of this comes as news to non-content people. Like, oh, I didn't know that using exclamation points like that meant I was shouting at people. I didn't know that, you know, saying, hey, so-and-so came off as unforgivably informal in this different market that we do business in, you, you know, like they just don't know. So I found that people were really, really grateful for that. And that made them hungry for more. Yep. That's one of the things I really appreciated about the book is because so many of us in the content profession, I mean, we're all, I'm, everybody's doing their best to get out of the fishbowl, but we're still swimming in that water that we've just known our whole careers. And you're so good at like imparting that to other people. That's great. Hey, I want to talk, follow up on something you just said about, you know, like one of your methodologies in the workshop is like, you talk to one person, you go, Hey, bring the team along with you. So that's a brilliant way of starting to scale this work. But the whole last chapter of your book is about scaling uh, this work at a higher level. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. Well, I mean, what, what it tends 
tends to happen eventually once people start to see the deeper content work that you can do and the value that somebody like you can provide, um, which is which is different from what the people that you deputize to do the surface work can do. Like that's amazing, right? They start to see like the particular value that you bring with the deeper work as they say, can we get some more like you, you know, like it, it finally actually starts to happen. Hey, can we get another you, you know, can we get five more yous? Um, and so that's one way of scaling your work, right. Is by actually you get to hire lead, be a part of a growing content team. Sometimes that's not the way it works. And, you know, sometimes economics doesn't let that work. Sometimes like just the growth stage that your company is at doesn't let that work. Who knows? Right. And, and maybe that has nothing to do with, how valued you are, whatever, right? So sometimes you have to scale your work in different ways. Sometimes, you know, you have to do these sort of more guerrilla marketing techniques. And then that could be something like just setting up a lunch and learn, you know, where you invite outside speakers to just share what they know about doing content in their organization. Those are hugely valuable. Um, maybe it's a maybe it's a book club. Maybe you all read a book and you talk about it. And this can be you and the other people that you've run workshops with, other people who have said this is kind of interesting, or I've kind of been deputized as the de facto content person in my part of my org. You just sort of start to gather your own little army of interested content people, whether or not they're officially part of your team. You can make them part of your team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you talk, you just mentioned a couple of the examples like the book club and <clears throat> things like that. And yeah. it's not like, there's not like a laundry list, but there's a lot of good ideas in that chapter about, uh, about different ways you could do that. And I think, and one of the things I think you do really well too is kind of highlight the bespoke nature of this, that this is going to unfold differently for everybody. There's all these things you mentioned, like, you know, budget and timing, you know, whatever it is. Um, and, and I, th 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 again, that's one of the things I feel like the, the book, it's not, you know, it's a how-to book, but a pretty high level how-to book. You know, it's sort of like, here's the approach you need to get this instilled. Mm -hmm. Have you seen, because I saw you talk about this at Con, what was that two or three years ago? Confab, it was one of the in-person yeah. Confabs. Yeah. And I'm, I'm trying to remember like, so you've, you've, these ideas have been out there for a little while. Have you, do you have disciples and folks who have reported <laughs> back success stories about yeah, there's a there's a there's a handful of people that have kept in touch with me. I hopefully there are even more people who have been too shy to sort of like keep me in the loop. But I know a lot of people came up to me after that after that talk at Confab in particular, um, and said that they were going to try. They were going to like start start the process. They were going to do these workshops. Maybe they were going to start a newsletter. Like a couple of them had even more creative ideas for how they were going to what they were going to use as their karaoke machine, as you'll see in the book, um, and. Um, and I also, I like to coach individuals too. I'm certified as a, as a coach and as a leadership coach. And I specifically like working with people who are trying to scale their content practice and trying to kind of either move into the world of UX writing or grow into leadership in, in content and, and in UX and, and in tech in general. Um, and so with those individuals that I've worked with, we, we often talk about this particular sort of methodology. And I've seen it work at a lot of different organizations. And as you say, it's quite, it's quite bespoke in a way that is, you know, it's organic. I think bespoke gives the idea of like, oh, you, it has to be like very sort of custom tailored. It's more of a mindset of like, yeah, go, go with the flow, go with what's going to be right for your organization. I think so many of us get really unnecessarily hung up by comparing with what other organizations are doing. I know that when I was growing the team, I would sometimes, you know, go, oh gosh, look at that other company. They have 30 content, you know, like what a dream that must be. You know, we just compare ourselves. And it's like, well, that's not, nobody was gonna write me a check to hire 30 people in one swoop. You gotta like have some steps in between here and there. And you just gotta, gotta work with it you got. You know? No, and yeah, there's so much in there. Like I have a friend, a very snarky friend, who's convinced that places like, you know, the big, the Fang, the big, you know, Facebook and Amazon and those guys, they can just throw people at problems, and you know, and they're probably not doing it any better than you. They just have a lot more people, and 
I, I don't know. It's it, anyhow, that's an interesting dynamic, but I, but I love that it. it always comes back to that pragmatic approach is work with what you got. And there's plenty of different ideas about, about um, how you can do that. You know, one thing I want to come back to, you just mentioned your leadership and coaching work. Mm-hmm. And so much of our work is really, we think it's about words, but it's really about people. You know, it's about behavior change, about organizational change, as you mentioned earlier. And now I'm, there's all this growing list of people. Like I didn't know that you did coaching work. I know like Tracy Playle and, mm-hmm. and Sarah Walker Betcher and, many others in the in the profession have have gone that route how did you end up doing that and how does that manifest in your work now it's so funny because i know i was just talking to sarah winters about this the other day too where she, where i believe she's going um in, down that path as well and we were both agreeing that the people that we work with you know they they come to us and say that what they need is some sort of like a content you know strategy help right and then what you find out is that there's this deeper layer that what they re- that before they can even start with that I'm not trying to put words in her mouth this is me right that you know before you can even get started with that um, it's this mindset change it's this organizational change piece it's like how to like get other people on board with the change that you want to see how to change the way you see yourself and that's why I talk so much about that stuff in the book is because it really, and that's why I started pursuing the coaching thing is because I found that this is what's really keeping us back is, is ourselves and how we see ourselves. I'm not trying to blame the victim here, but you know, like there's so much more that's possible if we just sort of get a little bit of a shift of mindset and, and start to, uh, uh, yeah, I don't know, take a more pragmatic approach. I think it's really common to think about like all the things that we don't have and to feel victimized because of that. Um, and that in itself is a trap. Yep, no, and it's so easy to do that when there's a hundred engineers and 10 UX designers and you're the lone content person. It's like, it's completely understandable, but I love that so much of your book focuses on that mindset shift that needs to happen mm-hmm. to just say, yep, that's how things are, great. What are you gonna do? You know? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yep, that's yeah. right. Well, cool. Hey, Beth, we're coming close to time. I, I'm always amazed at how quickly these conversations go, and I'd love to keep going. But but I, I do need to, to wrap up. But I want to give you one last chance. Is there anything that's come up in the conversation or just anything that's on your mind about content design or content strategy in general um, that you want to make sure we uh, get in before we wrap up? Yeah, you know, one of the things that I've been, I've been thinking about, and I'll maybe put this out there there was like a topic for a future talk is like, you know, we, I feel like we do in content, a lot of work sort of glomming on to other people's practices and other people's processes, you know? Um, and that the shift I think that we're gonna see and that we're gonna have to see in order to mature as a field is that we see, our, that we see content itself as a problem solving tool. Just like for the last 10 years, there's been the, the, the conversation has been about how like design thinking is itself a problem solving tool. It's a mindset, it's an approach that you can apply to anything, right? Well, the more I think about it, the more I think content, the content approach, the content mindset, and I don't know whether that framework is storytelling or, or what, but um, I think it's something like that, that, we're only ever going to be sort of wordsmiths and kind of like design, but this way, like design, but that way, and unless we figure out what that is. And I really think it's there, you know, like content itself is a strategic problem solving machinery. I, uh, I a hundred percent agree. And you're reminding of a conversation I had with a UX friend got a year or two ago about, I was, at, I was kind of expressing some jealousy about all they've got a seat at the table. They're making a lot of, you know, they're, they've made some more professional headway, I think than we have. And she said, you guys, you guys have to content strategy your content strategy, the same way that we UX our UX. And I think right. that's kind of what you're doing here. I think. Right. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Totally. So well, TBD, but I think that's my rallying cry is like, let's start thinking about that. Start as an, as a, as a group, as an entity, as a global community, let's start thinking about that. Absolutely. I'm on board. Let me know how I can help. <laughs> awesome. Yeah. Well, cool. Hey, and one very last thing, Beth, what's the best place if people want to follow you on social media or get in touch? Uh, what's the best way to connect? Probably Twitter's the best. Uh, it's definitely the most memorable handle. I'm just Beth done at Twitter, um, at, at Beth Dunn, right? Um, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn. I pretty much always accept connections from people who are in the field. Um, and, uh, and if you're interested, I don't do a whole lot of content stuff on uh, Instagram, but I'm the real Beth Dunn on Instagram. Sweet. Okay. And I'll put those in the show notes as well. Great. 
Well, thanks so much, Beth. Really enjoyed the conversation and really appreciate the work you're doing. Same. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. If you can think of a friend who might enjoy this episode, please share it with them. And please join us again for our next content strategy interview.